All right, guys, thanks uh, Thanks for joining me. Um, we got a bunch of charts today. We've had some webinars over the last uh, couple of months where I've kind of gone over my process and, um, you know, the ways that I look at markets and things like that. I want to take the opportunity today specifically to go over really what, you know, some of the best ideas out there, some of the things that I see, and, you know, hopefully I can add some value to some of the things that you're already seeing. We'll run through all the charts and then, you know, save your questions to the end. Um, you know, we'll try to spend as much time you know, maybe a little back and forth going over some of the different markets or maybe something that, um, you know, I went through real quick. So let's just get going. Um, for you guys that don't know me, um, you know, a lot of you guys know me from allstarcharts.com. I founded Eagle Bay Capital uh, almost three years ago, really for the sole purpose of being able to manage money uh, through one portfolio, through an LP structure. Um, you know, if you have any questions on that, um, I could be reach at info at eaglebaycapital.com. Um, you can also find me on Stock Twitch and Twitter at All Star Charts, and I was recently named a contributor to Yahoo Finance, so you'll probably see a lot of, uh, a lot of my work there. Um, you know, this is just for the attorneys, obviously. None of this is any solicitation uh, for any hedge funds. This is not buy and sell recommendations at all. Make sure that you contact your, you know, your tax accountants and you know, your own investment advisors before really making any decisions. Um, so that's definitely what this is. It's strictly for educational purposes and uh, entertainment purposes in some cases. <laughs> so let's get right into it. This is, this is really, I want to show you guys just a couple of simple principles before we get going um, so you guys understand really how I look at the markets. This is really my blank canvas. When I look at the markets, I like a 200 period moving average. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, I like a 14 period RSI for momentum. Um, that's what I personally use. And when I say periods, 200 period, the market is fractal. So if we're looking at a weekly chart, I'm looking at 200 weeks. If I'm looking at a daily chart, I'm looking at 200 days. Same thing with relative strength index for momentum. We use 14 periods, and that's whether it's a daily chart or a weekly chart or an intraday chart in, in the rare cases where we do look at those. Um, up at the top left, you'll see I like to use an average true range to get an idea of how volatile the security that we're involved with um, you know, really is. So uh, you know, before we enter a trade, you know, uh, something like Microsoft is not going to move like coffee. It's not going to move like a Tesla because they're just different animals. So I think it's important to understand how volatile and, and the beta of what you're in. And I really like the correlation analysis. We have a zero correlation target across the board. So I want to make sure that what we're in, you know, I want to see how close it's tied to the S&P 500 or, you know, perhaps other indexes as well, um, or energy and crude oil and things like that. So I look at a one month, one quarter, and one year correlation coefficient, um, you know, against the S&P 500 in this case, because we're looking at a chart of Facebook. So that's my uh, blank canvas. And I like to use candlestick charts, Japanese candlestick charts, because in my opinion, they really uh, tell the story the best. So just a couple of quick principles, guys. This is where it all begins, support and resistance. You know, this is what we call polarity. You know, what was former support should turn into resistance. Um, you know, and this is really technical analysis 101. Everything that we're going to go over really all comes back to this. Um, you know, that former support that you can see turns into resistance. You know, where there were buyers, there should be sellers. Where there was demand, there should be supply. Same thing on the other way around. You know, where there was resistance, once we break out, any retest should be met with support if that really, really is a true breakout. In a lot of cases, if that support doesn't show up, it, that was definitely a failed breakout, and we actually like that because the market really isn't that simple. You know, we, have, we bump up against resistance. We bump up. We bump up. Once we break out, if we're unable to hold, the sell-off that is coming is incredible. We actually just saw it in the S&P 500 and the Dow, this exact same pattern. Um, you know, so a lot of people are worried about failed moves. We not only not worry about it, we anticipate it and look for them because that, those are really the best risk-reward opportunities. Um, you know, you can see here, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse, but once it starts to roll over, you can see my mouse? Once it starts to roll over here, that's the entry because if you're, if you're shorting this right here and we get back above it, you're out. All bets are off because this was a breakout. Right? So the risk-reward becomes incredible, and if you're right on that entry, you're going to get a huge move. Same thing to the upside. Once we break down right, and we start creeping back up, that's your stock right back below the former support, and, a lot, and oftentimes you're going to get a big vicious move higher. So not only do we not worry about these moves, um, we, we, we try to anticipate them. Same thing like you know, in, in other traditional patterns as well. Here's a head and shoulders pattern that a lot of people look at. You know, once the neckline is broken, that's where you sell. You know, sometimes you get a kickback and it rolls over. 
we prefer the alternative. You know, by definition, you know, we're market participants. Markets trend. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, so by looking for reversal patterns, you are really defeating the whole purpose of this um, in terms of being in the right trend. So a good example of this, go back, look at the S&P 500 in the summer of 2010. You had a beautiful quote-unquote head and shoulders pattern that everybody in the media was talking about how it was breaking, and then you know, we all know what happened after that. It was exactly this. Um, and then same thing to the, um, same thing to the, uh, to the downside as well. So here's what I look at in momentum. I use a 14 period RSI, like I said, when, when, when markets are in an uptrend, and when I say markets, we can be talking about stocks, commodities, bonds, currencies, it doesn't matter. When we're in an uptrend, um, you know, during sell-offs, momentum should not reach oversold conditions. It should stay above 30. And then when it rallies, it should be getting into overbought conditions north of 70. Same thing when something's in a downtrend. During sell-offs, they should get oversold, and then when they do rally and we get those counter trend rallies, they should not reach overbought conditions. So, you know, just from a, a pure bullish and bearish range, this really gives us a lot of information. And then we also look at momentum for divergences. When prices are making new lows, you want to see uh, momentum making new lows as well and essentially confirming those lows. Here's an example of something that was making new lows in price and momentum was putting in higher lows. That's what we call a bullish divergence. Um, and then we all see what happened after that. Same thing to the, uh, to the upside. When prices are making new highs, you want momentum making new highs as well. When it doesn't, that's what we call a bearish divergence. And oftentimes, these mark uh, changes in trend. Now, it doesn't have to be a reversal in trend like it, it was in this case. It could be a change in trend where it would be sideways range as opposed to an uptrend uh, or whatever the case may be. But these are, these are often huge warning signals and something that we look for. And then really flat 200-day moving averages are something that we try to avoid. They really do just cause headaches. You know, if you, I like to keep my life easier. You know, um, I'm a keep it simple, stupid kind of guy. When you have a flat 200-day moving average, in this case, the blue line represents price. The red line represents the 200-day moving average or 200-week moving average. And what, what happens is you get a lot of false moves or whipsaws. You know, I, I, I highlighted here in this example, you know, a couple of breakouts that didn't work, a breakdown that didn't work. You know, you get a lot of mean reversions and, you know, a lot of traditional technical patterns fail and don't work. And it just, it creates a mess and headaches that, you know, we're better off not having to worry about. So that's just something that I wanted to bring up. So let's get into the markets. So here we're looking at the S&P 500. You know, I really want to, you know, I, I, I'm bearish sometimes and, you know, people call me a pessimist or whatever the case may be. But, you know, when, when we start this analysis, we really want to remember what's going on and, and within what context. I mean, we're in a raging bull market, you know, from a structural perspective. We're above the 2000 highs. We're above the 07 highs. So, you know, when you talk about how bad things are or might be or bear market or this, remember that this is coming within the context of a huge, huge uptrend over the last five and a half years. So let's just keep that in mind with everything that we do and everything that we say. Bigger picture, we look great, but let's worry about what we're going to be doing now. So here's the S&P 500 on a daily time frame. Um, you know, we can see that we broke down below that support over uh, throughout the summer. And I got pretty, uh, you know, I've been bearish really since, uh, you know, for a good six weeks or so. Really that failed breakout that we saw up there in September. And then when we broke down below the August lows, I got it. You know, structurally, I started to get much, much more worried. And then I said I would be neutral, more neutral, if we got back above the 1905, and we did. Um, so right now, we're kind of in no man's land in the S&P 500 tactically. Um, but look how we, we rallied straight to that 61.8% Fibonacci retracement um, from the initial decline and started to roll over today. I have a funny feeling that we're probably going to drop back below those August lows and at the very minimum retest uh, the lows from last week. I think that's going to happen quickly. Um, I think that's the higher probability outcome at this point, even though you know we're kind of in no man's land. I would argue that if we do take out today's highs, that would be extremely bullish, and in all likelihood, we're going to retest the highs from last month. Um, I would not expect that. I think that's the lower probability outcome, particularly because look at the, the relative strength index down below RSI. Notice how it just got into oversold conditions. Really, for the first time in the history of this particular chart, um, which is about a year-old chart, um, now that puts the S&P 500 in a bearish range for the first time. So that's a problem. We rolled over at the 61.8% retracement. Um, I think we're going lower. I tweeted earlier if, uh, you know, if you're looking for an, uh, an entry point on the short side, I think you got it today. 
Um, and here's just a closer look at that exact same chart. Here's a 65-minute time frame chart, um, which is, uh, you know, just so you can see what's going on intraday. Look at the highs last month, um, and then look at the lows last week, and we retraced uh, exactly 61.8% and, and how we love it, you know, similar to what we were talking about before on the failed moves. Same thing with Fibonacci. You know, we briefly exceeded those levels and started rolling over hard. Um, I love seeing that. I absolutely love it. So here are the mid caps. Um, uh, mid caps put in a double top at this summer, pretty clean. Um, you know, you can't draw it up any cleaner. You had pretty clean support right around that 250, 245, 250 level. You know, we broke that hard, and look how we successfully retested that today. Um, right near the 200 uh, day moving average as well. I think mid caps are going a lot lower. And then notice how in the relative strength index down below, um, we also hit oversold conditions as well and failed to get into overbought conditions um, at the September rally. So a lot of things are telling us that structurally things have changed in the mid caps, um, and you really want to see these guys leading the way. I'd argue if we got back above that 252, 253 level, um, you know, we would be much more no man's land, much less, uh, much less bearish. Um, you know, would be much more neutral up there. But at this point, you know, I think you could short these guys very aggressively um, from a risk reward standpoint. You got your entry earlier today, you know, but if we start doing getting back above that gray shaded area, you know, really all bets are off on the short side. Here's a Russell 2000, um, you know, breaking the uptrend line from the 2009 lows. Notice how on the recent highs uh, throughout 2014. Uh, momentum uh, was putting in a bearish divergence. Notice the lower highs in RSI while prices were making higher highs. That's a problem. We broke uh, a couple of weeks ago. We're retesting that as we speak. It looks like a topping pattern to me. I think we're going a lot lower. Um, you know, I, I, I find it very, very difficult um, to, to believe that we're going to go make new all-time highs here. And quite frankly, I can't think of anything that's going to really make me change my mind um, other than some time, I, I'd say if we if we consolidated above this 1100 level for for a while and really start putting a little bit of a base, then maybe um, you know. But I think that's the lower probability outcome. I think we're going a lot lower. I think we're. Uh, uh, I think this is a problem. I, I really, really do. But again, we try to keep an open mind. So if we do start consolidating above 1100, even above the highs from this week. This is a weekly chart. We start taking out the highs from this week. Then all right. Then I'll start getting more neutral. But from here, it looks like we're going lower. So these are United States Treasury bonds versus the S&P 500, um, TLT versus SPY. Notice how we're, we're coming off that same support from 2007. Um, this, to me, looks like it's going higher. I think it's got a lot of room. So when you say, where do you rather be, stocks or bonds, I think bonds are still the place you want to be. Like we've been saying that all year long, bonds have been going up all year. And for the most part, you know, sure, the headline says that the S&P is doing this and the Dow is doing that. Uh, but run the numbers, uh, the majority of stocks are down year to date, um, and the majority of the averages are down year to date as well, uh, while bonds have absolutely exploded with uh, interest rates crashing. Um, and I think this chart tells that story, and it looks, like, looks to me like we have a lot more uh, to go in this particular ratio. Here are interest rates on the 10-year. You know, people talking about a rising rate environment, to me that's, <laughs> to me that's hilarious. Um, you know, rates have been going down for 35 years, and people are talking about a rising rate environment. I think they're crazy. Um, you know, remember, people say, you know, rates, you know, they, they can't go any lower. they got to go higher. You know, please ignore those people. You know, historically, it'll take 10, 15, 20 years to put in a bottom um, in interest rates. Look back in U.S. history. Look at a long-term chart of bottoming process and rates. You know, this could take 20 years. So why are we in such a rush? And then the other thing that we know is that when interest rates do start going up, they don't stop going up. So if we know that there's going to be a huge bear market in bonds, and I can promise you that we will have one one day, but this, this structural bear market that we're going to eventually have in bonds is going to last forever. So what's the rush is the way I look at it. And looking at this chart, keep it simple, stupid, you know, there's your failed breakout, uh, you know, to start the year, and we just have gotten slaughtered in rates as bonds continue to head higher. And I see zero evidence um, of this changing. Looks to me like rates are going to continue to go lower like they've been doing for 35 years. Like, why are we in a rush to call the bottom in rates? And then this to me is just a hilarious chart. You know, really explains uh, to me why it is, um, you know, how the equities market is reacting to interest rates in the bond market. Dow Jones Industrial Average, you know, this, I think these numbers are a day old. Um, but Dow Jones Industrial Average flat to down on the year. Russell 2000 obviously been down all year. Mid caps essentially flat. S&P up a couple of percentage points, not a big deal. But look at the Dow Jones 
utility average. I mean, what a monster this thing has been. And the reason is because they're, they pay high dividends. So, you know, when you have fixed income investors looking for yield that they're obviously not getting in the bond market, they have to get that in the stock market. And, and where are you going to get that? You're not going to get that in small caps and mid caps that, you know, rarely pay dividends. You're going to get that in the utilities. So the Dow Jones Utility Index, um, you know, by far and away, doing better than the Dow Jones uh, Industrial Average for sure. So of the three Dow Jones uh, averages, that by far and away uh, does very well. Even though the transports have done pretty well this year, we're going to take a look at that chart in a minute. So here's the Dow Jones Utilities um, uh, Index itself uh, hitting all-time highs today, believe it or not. So you know, people pay attention to the you know, Dow Jones Industrial Average, but don't forget about the Dow Jones Utilities Index. That's a big one. So you know, throughout the, well, as we look at these charts, you know, we have different packages, you know, for our, our members, you know, that pay for our research. We have all the U.S. indexes and averages. In this case, the Dow Jones Utilities is there as well with the transports, S&P, mid-caps, you know, Russell 2000. We have a lot of members that receive that on a weekly basis. I think it really adds a lot of value just so that we understand where we are from a structural perspective and then break it down to the daily charts. All of our packages come with our charts on, uh, on multiple time frames. So here we are, Dow Jones Utilities Index making all-time highs. And here's the um, utilities sector itself, um, you know, which is another one of our packages. All the major U.S. Uh, sectors, you know, utilities, energy, financials, whatnot. And there are a lot of the subsectors as well. So you'll get the biotechs and the gold miners um, and the financials and, you know, the uh, broker dealers and the regional banks and things like that. We'll go over that at the end. But utilities, just a good example. You have the sector doing very well and you have the index itself doing very well. Obviously, we shouldn't be surprised. Look at momentum, by the way, in both of these. How nice does that look? Not getting into oversold conditions, continuing to get into overbought conditions. I mean, it looks fantastic. So here's one of my favorite utility stocks. Here's Duke Energy making all-time highs. Look at momentum. What a thing of beauty. You know, so if, if, if we're going to be in, the, in long U.S. stocks, unless we're playing some kind of mean reversion, like, you know, the energy names last week, for example, um, you know, a lot of the names actually bounce nicely. Um, you know, but if, if we're going to be buying something, you know, I prefer to be buying strength. And, you know, this, is, this to me just says buy dips, buy any weakness. And the strength here you know, we do a lot of intermarket analysis and we go back and forth, right? So is it, you know, is it, it's a chicken or the egg. You know, is, is Duke Energy doing so well because rates are getting clobbered or is uh, the fact that Duke Energy doing well telling us that rates are going to continue to get clobbered? You know, I, I'd argue that it's probably a little bit of the both, but I think it's important to recognize, you know, what certain markets are doing and what information we can gather from that. Utilities have been outperforming the S&P 500 since the beginning of the year. So, you know, they were telling us that rates were going lower. So if you weren't listening to that and you were listening to The Economist for some reason, um, you know, you got that wrong. And, you know, just on that note, you know, to listen to what economists are saying to make decisions in the market really defeats the whole purpose of looking at the market in the first place. Economists look at backward-looking information. That's all they do. And the information that they look at is going to get revised 100 times in the next couple of years. So to me, it's silly to listen to anything these, these people have to say. They're not market participants. They look at backward-looking information. The market, by definition, is forward-looking in nature. You know, I'd argue 6, 9, 12 months in advance. So to listen to an economist, oh, 67 out of 67 of them thought that interest rates were going higher this year. I mean, come on. It couldn't have been more wrong. So here's Duke Energy relative to the S&P 500. How nice does this look? Um, you know, this is a ratio chart. You know, if you want to be equities neutral with a lot of times, you know, if we're not really sure what the market's going to do and you kind of just want to have a neutral bias, you know, being long of one and short of another is a great way to do that. Um, this is breaking out of this downtrend line, coming off some nice support. Um, and based on what we're seeing in, in, in utilities as a group, what we're seeing in Duke Energy as a group, I'm not surprised that on a relative basis this is looking so nice. Here's Duke relative to utility. So as you can see, we can continue to break it down, and that's really what it's called, a top-down approach. Looking at the markets, looking at the major indexes, you know, looking, seeing how, noticing how utilities are by far and away the strongest ones, um, and then noticing how uh, you know, Duke is doing well relative to the market itself. Duke is doing very well on its own. And now you can break it down into the components of the utilities. Here's Duke Energy coming off of support, which is former resistance, and it looks like it's going to break this downtrend line from a few years ago. looks like it's got a long way to go. So, again, if you want to stay neutral in equities, particularly neutral of utilities, if you're really not sure, on a relative basis, this looks great, especially if it breaks out. 
So here we're looking at uh, healthcare. Talk about strong sectors. This is the only sector of the ten of the major sectors in the S&P 500 that is up to the 261.8% um, Fibonacci extension from the 2007 to 2009 decline. There is no other sector that you can say that about that has already reached that 261 extension. So you know this is something that's very important. We go over this. You know we have our U.S. sectors. Uh, package that our you know our, our 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 members receive on a weekly basis, and we continue to talk about the strength here. You know we shouldn't be surprised that it, it's running into resistance because this Fibonacci extension. You know it, we should recognize it as supply, but the fact that it's already here and the fact that it's it's hanging out up there is great. I'm a little bit what I'm a little bit annoyed by the bearish divergence that it's putting in in. in um, in momentum, but I think just from a pure relative strength standpoint, you know, healthcare, there's nothing better out there. And here's UNH, here's a Dow component, um, you know, part of our Dow 30 package that we have for our members, you know, they get all 30 Dow components on multiple time frames. You know, we shouldn't be surprised that United Health, look what a monster this thing is, making new highs, momentum in a bullish range, getting overbought in rallies, staying away from the oversold territory in, in corrections. I mean, this thing looks great. I think it's probably heading back up towards that 95 and a half, which is the 161 extension from the uh, 07 and 08 decline. You know, I'd say if we started breaking down on a weekly closing basis below the uptrend line from the 08 lows, you know, I, I would start to get a little bit more cautious. But I mean, just from a relative strength standpoint, I mean, this thing's just a beast. So here we are. Here's UNH relative to the S&P 500 breaking out, breaking out to new multi-year highs, and it looks like this got room. So again, you know, looking at things. From the top down, healthcare looks great. United Health looks fantastic, and here's UNH relative to the S&P 500 making new highs. We love that. So here are a couple of Dow components I wanted to go over. Um, you know, again, part of our Dow 30 package. Nike, um, you know, once it broke out and we had a 10-point measured move based on the size of that particular pattern, we hit that very quickly. Um, but I love the fact that it continues to bang its head up against these levels. Um, you know, it's very important to have these measured moves and, and, and do the math on where the market should go. It's not a coincidence where it stalled. Um, you know, this is what we told our members. You know, we told our members to back off, take profits at this point, and we'll reevaluate. Re and every single week that we're reevaluating, the longer that we hang out up here, the more bullish it is. So at this point, I'd either want to buy a correction down to the low 80s from the original breakout level or be long only above the highs over the previous month. Either, either or, um, I'm, I'm happy with that. Again, look at momentum. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, getting overbought during rallies, staying away from oversold conditions during corrections. That's what we like to see. Another Dow component that did basically the exact same thing um, was Home Depot. You know, look at that beautiful base over the last couple of years. We had a ten and a half point range um, in that particular uh, congestion. We hit that move, that that measured move, very, very, very quickly, uh, ninety three and a half. And sure enough, not a coincidence coincidence that that's where we stalled. And the fact, same thing as Nike, the fact that we've continued to hold on to those levels and we stay up here, that's very bullish. So um, same thing like Nike, I would only want to buy it above the highs over the last two months. That's where I want to own it. And then because that's, we know where to put the stop. You know, if we're buying this at 94 and we have a stop below 93 and a half, that's a great risk reward. Um, you know, if you, if you want to be on the long side and then look at the relative charts compared to the S&P 500, they, they look great. Now here's a here's a terrible one. Um, this is one of my favorite charts in the Dow. You know, we told our members last uh, last Tuesday there was no reason to own this. You know, I didn't know that IBM was going to come out with terrible earnings or whatever the bad announcement was. You know, I don't I don't pay attention to any of that stuff. Um, but my understanding is that it wasn't very good news. Um, but price uh, precedes the news. The news, the price doesn't follow news. Price makes moves, and then the news follows. Um, and I think this is a great example that looks to me like we got a long way to go. Um, and then what's also interesting, look at momentum hitting oversold conditions. That is not what you want to see if you're a bull. Um, you know, that's what you want to see if you're a bear, which obviously we have been. Um, this is one of my favorite charts. Um, I love it. I think it goes lower. Here's another one. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we complicate things a lot. Um, you know, I pride myself in being more simple. But even still, you know, we do have some, some more complicated models and things like that. But simple supply and demand, folks. I mean, this was one of the easier calls to make. Prices in Merck rallied back up to these 07 highs. To think that we're just going to break through those levels like they're not even there, 
um, you know, I, I think would be uh, irresponsible of us, really. So that was a really easy short. Um, you know, you, 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 as we approach those highs, if we do take out the 07 highs, all bets are off because we do like to keep an open mind, and we are wrong sometimes. But from a risk-reward standpoint, as it got up to those highs, that was a no-brainer. Um, you know, we told our members, you know, put, you keep the, keep the stops above those levels, be short all day. Um, and we had a bearish momentum divergence at the same time. You can't beat it. So, I mean, this was really an easy, easy call. Um, and sometimes they are. You know, we don't have to overcomplicate things. And based on where I think it goes, you know, the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement from the uh, 2011 rally to, to this year um, is right around 49.50. And that was also resistance last year. So that looks like a good level to cover shorts. And then here are a couple of Dow components that I think are setting up. Um, you know, look at travelers, how healthy this is. You know, consolidating above, you know, former resistance. Um, momentum put in a bearish divergence, but it's working its way up over time. You know, like uh, Nike and Home Depot, I really would only want to be long above the highs over the last several months, um, which I think happens soon. But this is one of the healthier names out there that is on our watch list. And so is Boeing. Uh, my understanding is Boeing is doing very well after hours. Um, it's down after hours. Okay, either way, it's been really consolidating in a nice, healthy way. I would only want to be long above these former support levels. Um, but to me, if it can hold, and we'll, we'll see tomorrow if it does or it doesn't, we really only want to be buying a breakout above uh, the downtrend line from earlier in the year. It looks like a descending triangle to me. If we break down, then we don't want to be in it and never broke out anyway, so we wouldn't be in it anyway. Um, but just something that we're watching on our watch list, um, and if it does break out above the blue downtrend line, you know, I think that it's got legs to the upside. So we'll, we'll wait and see. So those are two names, um, the Travelers and the uh, Boeing, that are just kind of on our watch list if we do get breakouts. So getting back to the top-down approach, you know, looking at components of different sectors, you know, Intel running into the 161% Fibonacci extension from the 2012 decline, um, you know, was reason enough to take profits. Um, I like the overshoot of it as an entry point um, for a short. Um, you know, which we, we, we talked to our members about, but also the implications that something like this has in an overall sector. Um, you know, here's SMH. Intel's 20% of this thing. So when you have Intel running into um, a, a key Fibonacci extension and a potential failed breakout and bearish divergence in the sector itself, you know, it all comes together. It's all telling us the same thing. You know, either get out of semiconductors or short. We're sure the hell out of them. I mean, that was a great entry point in Intel. Um, I think Intel continues lower. It looks to fill that gap. It looks like it's rolling over here again. Notice how momentum after the bearish divergence got into oversold conditions uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, now we're in a bearish range after a failed breakout. It looks like semis and Intel are heading lower, if you ask me. All right, so getting into currencies, here's the dollar. You know, this is something that I loved in May, and I was pounding the table. And, and nobody, nobody, I mean, not only did people think the dollar was going to crash, you know, nobody wanted even to talk about the dollar. I mean, it was just a, a mess. And this is, this is right around here, um, right, in the, right in the high 70s um, when everybody hated it. I absolutely loved it. I thought we were going to get an epic squeeze. Um, you know, I wrote about it. I was very vocal about it. You know, here you can see, what, you know, the, the pessimism. Here we're looking at the uh, at, at sentiment data for the U.S. dollar index. You know, this is where we were in May. Everybody hated it. And now it's pretty funny. Everybody loves it after a monster move. Isn't that hilarious? So, I mean, whether you were in it or not, or whether you care about currencies or not, you know, just watching sentiment unwind and seeing, you know, how silly uh, people are, um, you know, it really is fascinating. And understand that this is a flaw that we have as human beings, because throughout evolution, we, um, we were safer traveling in packs. We were safer traveling in herds. You know, back in the day, if you were walking around the jungle by yourself, you're going to get eaten by a lion. But if you're one of a hundred you know, holding, you know, sticks with flames on it, the lions are going to leave you alone. So throughout evolution, we have that engraved in our heads, and people take that and do that in the market, and that's the worst thing you could possibly do. Um, you know, so when it comes to sentiment, there's always a lot of noise in the middle, and we like to mostly ignore sentiment. We only want to pay attention to when it hits extreme levels. So right now we're at extreme bullish levels um, in, in, in dollars, and as we approach this, a downtrend line from the 2005 highs. You know, was this a failed breakout above those uh, above the downtrend line? I think there's a there's a good chance that it was. 
especially with uh, sentiment where it is. So you want to keep an open mind. Um, you know, we, we, we moved here very, very quickly into those levels. I think it's got failed breakout written all over it. I would say that the longer this consolidates up here um, without correcting down, I would say that that's probably a very bullish thing. Um, but I think that's the lower probability the outcome. If I had to guess, um, I think dollars are going lower, um, you know, especially based on that sentiment. And then, um, and here's a commitment of traders report where it tells us what the hedgers are doing, what the smart money is doing. Um, the smart money is, you know, is, is hedging uh, up here. Uh, smart money thinks uh, dollars are going lower. And here's euro sentiment. Um, they hate the euro. Notice how they love the euro back in May. Um, you know, when you should have hated it because the euro just got slaughtered, and now, now they hate the euro, um, now that I, I'm starting to like it, um, because remember that the euro is 60% of the dollar index, so whatever the euro is going to do, in all likelihood, the dollar is going to do the opposite, so we shouldn't be surprised that the dollar index, everybody loves it, and they hate the euro, so that makes perfect sense, and another reason why I think the euro can get a bounce here, um, and the dollar is in all likelihood probably going lower, so these are just some themes that I'm seeing that I wanted to share with you guys, um, you know, whether we do anything about it or not, it's not the point, um, just understanding what's really going on in the currency market and where sentiment is. So how's that going to affect everything? I mean, here's the gold miners. I mean, you talk about one of the worst sectors um, in the world. And when I write the reports for our members that, you know, pay for our, our, our sectors and subsectors, I, I've started out many paragraphs and sentences saying, you know, the gold miners are the worst sector on earth or the grossest sector on, on earth or whatever it is. Um, you know, and I kind of just make myself chuckle, um, you know, this is a disaster. And I figured that we were going to get a little bit of a bounce from these lows uh, last year. You know, there's a weekly chart of the GDX Gold Miners Index, and we're not even acknowledging these lows. I mean, if, if this thing just breaks through these levels like it's not even there, I mean, oh, my God, goodbye. Notice the declining 200-week moving average. Look at momentum breaking the small uptrend. I mean, and, and, and here's another thing. So when you look at momentum divergences, and you can see that we're putting in a higher low here, right, towards the end of last year, when we put in lower lows in price, when these divergences don't turn into real rallies, and sure, we got a little bit of a short squeeze here, but when they don't turn into extended rallies and they roll over again, man, there is nothing more bearish. And I think there's a good chance that that's precisely what's happening here. So here's gold itself, and again, notice how we continue with the intermarket stuff. You know, we're looking at the, the, the dollar index, we're looking at sentiment, we're looking at the euro, then we're looking at a U.S. sector of a group of gold mining stocks. Now we're looking at gold itself, uh, which is a commodity. So I think it's important to really incorporate everything that we're seeing to make our ultimate conclusions and, and really figure out, you know, where we want to be and where we don't want to be. This is one of the, you know, gold bugs have been telling you to buy gold for years, and it continues to make lower lows. The more times that the level is tested, the higher the likelihood it breaks, guys. And this is now the third test of support. You know, sure, I think we got a little bit of a bounce here, I've been saying, for the last month or so, and we're seeing it. But, man, I think this ultimately breaks. And when we, when we break those levels, um, you know, call it, you know, 1180, you know, when we start breaking those down, I think we go to 1,000. You know, 1,000 was big-time uh, resistance back in 2008, 2009. So that looks like a big level to me, 1,000 bucks. I think that's probably where we're at. Let's break for a break first. Which we, and by the way, here's another interesting sentiment chart. You know, we're, we're not even at the bearish extreme levels that we were last summer. So even though we're still at the lows from last summer, there's a little bit more optimism um, in the gold market, which I like. I think that could be the catalyst to really take us lower. Here's silver. Um, notice how silver already did break. Gold has tested that support three times. Um, for silver, it tested support three times, then broke on the fourth. Um, so in all likelihood, gold would like will probably break on the fourth as well. Um, you know, we've hated silver forever, um, and it continues to make lower lows. I like that that target underneath 14 bucks. I think that's where we're headed. That's the 161.8 percent Fibonacci extension from the um, the original correction last summer, upside correction. So that looks like a good target to me. If we start getting back above the former support levels from the last year. Um, all bets are off, and a more neutral stance would be appropriate. Um, but I think that's the lower probability outcome. Looks to me like we're heading a lot lower. Um, and here's the, goal, uh, the, the the metals and miners XME. Um, you know, it's a lot of the, the the mining stocks and things like that. Again, another disaster. One of the worst sectors out there. Here we are looking at support from last summer. I think this thing breaks, man. I really, really do. And I think we're probably headed to the lows of 09. Um, you know, we want to be short only below the last year's lows. 
we don't, you know, above last year's lows and we're in no man's land like where we are right now. But if we do break, and I think we do break um, last, last year's lows, uh, we're heading a lot lower quickly. Um, but let it break first. Look at momentum. Notice how it, it can't get into overbought conditions. Have, hasn't done it in years. And on all the sell-offs, it gets into oversold conditions. That's what we like to see in a bear market. And then here are materials. You know, you talk about, you know, uh, gold miners, and you talk about the metals and mining, and, you know, you talk about, you know, how bad some of these base metals are. But materials, it, you know, this goes back to, to understanding, you know, what you own and what you're in. And the materials ha actually have a lot of chemical components as well. So although, um, you know, materials in theory should be a lot lower, the XLB with its exposure to chemicals um, is actually holding up pretty well. So we only want to be long this above the 2008 highs. You know, we had a little whipsaw last week. Um, but that, that's really where you want to be long from a structural standpoint. We break below the 08 highs on a weekly closing basis. We want nothing to do with this. Um, but I just want to show you, understand, and make sure you know what it is that you own and what the components are. Here's coal. What a disaster this thing is. Um, you know, continues to make lower lows, lower highs. Beautiful bear market. Um, you know, getting back to the, the, the bullish divergence, the potential bullish divergence that we had earlier this year that failed. And now look how quickly we're breaking down. So we're, we're seeing these trends a lot, bullish divergences that are failing. Nothing is more bearish. I actually started getting bullish right around here on this breakout. So as long as we hold these highs, uh, you know, we're in, and then we fail quickly, and, you know, all bets were off, obviously, and we've just been selling off ever since. So there's nothing to like here. I continue to be in a sell the rally uh, sort of point of view from there. Now moving on to emerging markets. Um, you know, I think it's a good transition from where we were in the metals and things like that. A lot of these emerging markets have base metal exposure. Copper and emerging markets really move together. Um, but let's get back to what we were originally talking about, about a flat 200-period moving average. This is a headache, folks. I mean, you know anybody who's having fun trading emerging markets? I mean, there is nothing fun about this. We're within a giant symmetrical triangle. Um, on rallies, we can't get into overbought conditions. Um, you know, I think we ultimately break down and start heading lower. But we'll wait for the breakdown before we do anything. Um, the flat 200-week moving average basically tells us that there literally is no trend in emerging markets. So as you can imagine, relative to the S&P 500, emerging markets look terrible. Here's Latin America. Speaking of terrible emerging markets, this is literally one of the worst places on earth. Look at the uh, look how it tried to break above the downtrend line from 2012, rallied into the 200-week moving average, and been selling off ever since. Notice how the uh, bullish divergence um, that I tried to create earlier this year uh, failed to turn into a real rally. Obviously, with a downward sloping 200-week moving average, there was little reason to believe that it would turn into a real rally. Um, you know, we took that opportunity, sell into that 200-week, um, and then we rolled over hard. Look at the failed break, failed breakout. Looks like we're heading a lot lower in Latin America, um, which is probably a pretty decent indicator for emerging markets as a group. Um, speaking of bad emerging markets in Latin America, here's Brazil. Uh, probably one of the worst countries in the world. Um, again, look, it, it looks exactly like Latin America, doesn't it? Look at that. You had a failed breakout, ran into the 200-week, rolled over, now making lower lows. Same exact thing here. Couldn't even hit the 200-week in, in Brazil. Um, the, the, the bullish divergence not turning into anything good. Um, looks like we're heading a lot lower here as well. Um, I'd be very, very careful. Here's Chile. Um, Chile has got a lot of exposure to metals and mining, so you know it'll, it'll move with those guys. And again, one of the worst places to be. So not only do emerging markets is not somewhere that we want to be. Latin America is even worse. Chile is even worse than Latin America as a group. So you know it, it's all about looking at things from the top down. I, 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 I keep looking for reasons to maybe own this for a mean reversion, and just there's just no reason to to own this. Looks like we're heading lower. Um, here we're looking at um, ILF, Mexico relative to ILF. So this is Mexico relative to emerging markets as a group. So if there's one emerging market that, you know, if you had to be in one of them, um, you know, especially in Latin America, I, I'd say it's Mexico. Look at Mexico compared to, to Latin America. Beautiful trend over the last five years, um, you know, consolidating these gains very, very nicely. Uh, it looks like new all-time highs are in the cards for these guys. So this is EWW. Um, long EWW short ILF. Now, in, uh, elsewhere in emerging markets, here's Russia. Uh, again, one of the worst places to be. Um, you know, I think you know, with a declining 200-week moving average, momentum in a strong bearish range. Notice how we can't get overbought. We keep getting oversold. If we take out the lows from earlier in the year, 
which I think is coming soon. Uh, looks like you're going to see 18 bucks in RSX. You know, that's the 161.8 percent Fibonacci extension from the range over the last three years, and it's also support after the correction in 2009. So that to me looks like a solid target. Uh, 18 bucks on RSX, and that's something we want to be getting short only below the uh, the lows of uh, earlier in the year. Uh, here's Egypt, uh, failed breakout. You know, we warned our, our, our members about this, our global macro members that, you know, get all the global ETFs. Egypt is one of them. Look at the bearish divergence, failed breakout. You know, at this point, we're at big time support that was resistance over the last several years. Um, but based on the bearish momentum divergence and failed breakout, um, you know, I, I think we're heading lower. I, I, I really, really do. Um, we're acknowledging that support a little bit here. But we had a breakaway gap, a failed breakout, a downward sloping 200-week moving average, um, and a bearish divergence. Uh, th this is the, this is ugly. It looks like I think we're heading a lot lower. Um, here's a closer look at the daily time frame. Remember, all of our members on all of our packages receive um, all of our charts on both daily and weekly time frames. So in this case, we're looking at daily. There's your failed breakout that we just saw. Now momentum is in oversold condition, which is now in a bearish range. Um, we found resistance at the 200-day moving average. To me, this is heading lower. So here are the Dow transports relative to crude oil over the last couple of years. You know, crude oil is just a hot mess. You know, look at a, a flat 200-week moving average. No reason to be long this. And the, and the transportation index has done very, very well uh, compared to crude oil. So this has been a great, uh, a great pair. I'm not saying to put this on right now, but I did want to show that that particular correlation and you know, how the transports have done. And, you know, to somebody's point earlier today on, uh, on stock tweets and Twitter, they were telling me how, you know, transports have been doing well before oil rolled over, um, which is absolutely right. Um, you know, so, you know, when we look at these correlations, um, you know, we also want to look at them in, on their own as well. So here's oil. There's the, the two, flat 200 day that we've been talking about. And there are the headaches. There's a failed breakdown at the beginning of the year. Then you had a failed breakout this summer. Um, I mean, this literally just creates headaches. So when you have these flat moving averages, stay away. There's no reason to be involved. Um, but at this point, you know, we're down at support uh, from spring last year. <coughs> I think we could potentially get a little bit of a bounce. Um, you know, it's not anything that I, I'd be wanting to take advantage of just yet. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more, maybe, maybe a, a brief break below and a quick reversal back or something like that. Uh, but with a flat 200-week moving average, and some former support here, I think there's a decent shot, um, you know, at a mean reversion, um, you know, some, something on the, on the watch list, not anything actionable today or tomorrow, but something to put on the watch list. And I think at this point, everybody um, and their brother realizes that uh, crude oil has gone from over 100 to 80 very, very quickly. So by the time the media uh, figures this out, it's usually too late. So again, another reason to have this on the watch list. I really wish there was a... <clears throat> I really wish that there was like a bullish momentum divergence, similar to what we got at the beginning of the year. You got a failed breakdown, bullish momentum divergence, and beautiful rally. If we could, if we can get something like that developing here in momentum, I would absolutely love crude oil. But we're not there yet, so give it a little bit of time. Especially as we're going in, uh, um, you know, to a period that is not uh, necessarily the best time of the year. This is actually the worst five-month period uh, seasonally for crude oil. So again, you know, no, not a reason to force things just yet. If we can start building a little bit of a base, like I said, you know, create a bullish momentum divergence or something like that during what is historically the worst time of year for crude oil, um, you know, the fall and early winter, um, you know, that, that might be something. But again, another reason to stay away here. So how is that affecting the equities market? Here's a really interesting chart, guys. This is the energy sector as a group failed breakout above the 2008 highs. This is not what you want to see. And now momentum is hitting oversold conditions and is in a bearish range for the first time since 2008. If you have a failed breakout, momentum in a bearish range, I mean, this is, this is really, really bad, guys, really bad. Um, just a couple more charts, you know, how that's being affected. Here's Exxon relative to the S&P making new lows. On a relative basis, these are the worst names of the Dow components, Exxon and Chevron both. You know, these are... You know, to me, these are in strong, strong relative downtrends. I mean, these are disasters, both of them, Exxon and Chevron. I see no reason to be involved with these at all. Um, 
uh, on a relative basis anyway. So here's natural gas, flat 200-week moving average, just a headache waiting to happen. This is a dead market. You know, I loved natural gas since 2012. Um, you know, I had a target of six and a half, six, six to six and a half. We hit that. You got to be disciplined. That's it. We're out. See you later. So people used to think that I was a natural gas trader because I would talk about it a lot and, you know, I really liked it, but I'm not a natural gas trader. I just look for opportunities and I see zero opportunity here, uh, long or short. And here is, uh, on a seasonal basis, something interesting. You know, seasonally, natural gas is supposed to do well um, September and October. That's two months of the year, and it didn't. And when the market ignores seasonal trends, right, it didn't do anything. When market ignores seasonal trends, be careful um, because there are larger forces at work. So not only do we want to stay away from this, you know, the seasonally, what's going on is uh, very worrisome. And just a couple of more commodities that I think are, are worth talking about quickly. People hate uh, 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 the agricultural names, specifically soybeans. Um, look here at the Commitment of Traders report. You know, they, they hate the soybeans. Hate them. So, so I think we're getting mean reversion trades in the beans. I think we're getting mean reversion trades in corn. And I think we're getting mean reversion trades in wheat. Look at the bullish momentum divergences. Look at the 200-day uh, uh, the, the, the moving averages are, are, are very far away. Um, these are still in downtrends, so I'd be quick to take profits. But I see these as mean reversion trades. They still do. Coffee is one that you know was a home run at the beginning of the year. Look at that failed breakout. This is just a good example of why we stay away from things with flat 200 period moving averages. We should not be surprised if that was a failed breakout because we have a flat, we have a lack of trend. So this is a, a market that we want to stay away from, coffee. Um, and then finally, guys, um, just to finish up before we go into the Q&A, um, I just want to show you guys three of my favorite charts in the world, you know, kind of end things on a good note. You know, this is USD CAD. So this is long US dollars, short Canadian dollars. And look at this beautiful base over the last several years. Look at that form of resistance turning into support. Look at the 200-week moving average turning up. Look at momentum in a bullish range. To me, this is a market that we want to continue to be buying weakness, buying dollars, selling Canadian dollars, um, you know, shorting Canadian dollars outright. Um, you know, this to me is one of my favorite charts in the world for sure where we want to be buying weakness. Here's S&P 500 relative to emerging markets. As we mentioned before, S&P has been rocking for years, and emerging markets haven't done anything. They didn't, they didn't get the memo that we're in a structural bull market. And look at this. This is the ratio. This is long um, U.S., long S&P 500, and short emerging markets, short EEM. Beautiful base, breakout, retest. This, to me, looks like it's going a lot higher. Um, I'd argue that if we started to break below the lows from earlier this year, all bets are off, but I think that that is definitely the lower probability outcome. I think the U.S. on a relative basis is where you want to be, um, especially versus emerging markets in Latin America where you don't want to be. And finally, um, here's the U.S. against Europe. I mean, this chart makes me so happy. Um, you know, we continue to be better than Europe. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, new highs today. Uh, this is long SPY, short FEZ. Um, so FEZ is essentially, you know, the Dow 30 of, uh, of Europe, if you will, um, you know, the biggest companies in Germany and Spain and France, um, and S&P 500, obviously, you guys know what that is. So this long SPY, short FEZ, making new highs, breaking out of a beautiful multi-year symmetrical triangle. I think we got a long way to go. Love U.S. on a relative basis compared to Europe and compared to emerging markets. So just real quick, um, you know, as a, as a gift to you guys, you know, we have a few special offers that is, a, you know, one time only. Um, our gold package is all of the global ETFs. You're going to get over 90 charts um, from all over the world on multiple time frames you, you, with relative strength analysis, momentum analysis, smoothing mechanisms, um, support and resistance, risk management. Um, so you're going to get all 90 plus charts every single week, all Europe, Latin America, Asia. And then you're also going to get um, the U.S. averages and interest rates, which we mentioned, all the indexes, Dow, S&P, 10-year yield, volatility index, et cetera, and you're getting this all for $129 a month. So I think that that is a great, a great deal. You're essentially getting uh, the U.S. averages for free uh, with the global markets. And, um, you know, I think that that's a great one that you get both. Another one that we're giving is our platinum package. For $99.99 a year, um, you're getting all the global markets, as we mentioned, and all of the S&P sectors. So in my opinion, I think this is probably the best value. You guys can go to vip.marketfi.com backslash jc-perets, um, and you'll be able to have access to all of these. 
again, you're getting all S&P sectors, which, um, if I'm not mistaken, comes with over 60 charts. Again, multiple time frames, and you're getting the 90 plus charts of the global markets as well. Um, so I think that's a great one. Again, 9.99 a year. And then finally, um, you know, here, here it is for you guys, just so you can take a look at it all. Uh, 129 a month or 9.99 a year. Um, you know, these are two great values in my opinion. You know, I, I'd love for you guys to take advantage of it. And then remember, you also get access to me as well. You can message me anytime, and you know, our members do that. You know, hey JC, can you look at this chart? Or hey JC, can you send me this chart? Or whatever it is. Um, you know, you always have access to me through our messages. Um, they're private messages; nobody else sees them, um, and I usually respond uh, within the day for sure. So again, um, you know, I really want to thank you guys for being here. Um, you know, really definitely take advantage of these packages. Uh, my understanding is the offer's over tomorrow. Um, so again, vip.marketfight.com backslash JC dash Peretz. And we'll be sending you guys the recording of, of all of this uh, in case you missed anything. But I think at this point, we can open it up to questions. Yeah, 100%, JC. And first of all, I'll introduce myself. I'm Nathan from Marketify, and I'll be the, uh, the producer here who is going to be kind of the intermediary for questions. So if you do have any questions, this is an amazing opportunity to have your questions answered by one of the best in the business. So do type your questions into the GoToWebinar chat box. And JC, this has been a tremendous presentation. So thank you from me. Thank you for everyone in the audience. Um, and I'm really excited to get to this Q&A portion of the, of the session. Um, I also want to point out that the link for that offer has been posted into your GoToWebinar chat box. That's vip.marketify.com slash jcparrots. And that's a, a link that you can just click on straight from the, Go to, the GoToWebinar chat box. So make sure to check that out. The first question comes in from Amit. Amit wants to know, JC, what is a squeeze and how do you apply it? Sure. Um, you know, a squeeze is, a, it, you know, what's the true definition of squeeze, right? Um, you know, what we can do is, let's do this, uh, let's do this right. Um, you know, can you guys see this chart? All right? Looks good. Yeah. All right. Um, let me just take this thing off. I don't even know how to take this thing off. Um, oh, well, whatever. Um, so a squeeze, I, you know, again, it's a tough definition, but I would say uh, that it comes when you have uh, really too many shorts leaning in the wrong direction. I think a great example of that is Treasury bonds coming into the year. And you guys can see that all right? So notice here, um, so here we had coming into the year, right? So this is uh, the end of December, early January, and you had a failed breakdown. Um, you know, I think this is a great example of a squeeze. You had extreme bearish sentiment in the United States Treasury bonds. You had all the economists telling you to sell bonds, which well, obviously we never want to listen to economists. Um, so the fact that everybody was leaning in the wrong direction with sentiment where it was, momentum putting in bullish divergences, and a failed breakdown, once we got above it, that's when we got the squeeze. Um, and that's a great example. In fact, you know, we could go back and, uh, you know, here, when we went over the different patterns, this is a great example of a, of, of a squeeze. You know, when you get that brief breakdown and then you get the move. And these squeezes can happen from a lot of different ways. They can be, you know, from too much short interest, for example, and that short interest unwinding. It could be from sentiment. You know, it could be from a combination of the two. Um, but the, the squeezes really um, offer some of the best risk-reward opportunities for sure. Um, you know, in fact, we were looking at... Um, Good example of a short squeeze when we're looking at crude oil. Let's see, um, crude oil back in 2012. Where is this chart? Come on, Jay. Where, where is it? Here it is. Um, right here, back in, in uh, at the beginning of the year. Actually, this chart doesn't go back to 2012, but that was another good one. Um, here, you had a failed breakdown in crude oil. You see that at the beginning of the year, and then you got the squeeze, right? And a bullish momentum divergence. So this is what I would consider a squeeze. So. You know, there's a lot of definitions for it. Um, I think it's when, you know, there's just too many people leaning in the wrong direction and they get squeezed, right? Hmm. Thanks, JC. Next one is from Jason. Jason is looking at the U.S. dollar, Canadian dollar. He's seeing bearish uh, Momo divergence as well, also with health healthcare. And his question is from Jason, when are you supposed to pay attention to these RSI divergences? Right. So that's a great question, actually. So when you have pivot points, when you have pivot highs and pivot uh, lows, so in this case, we're looking at USD CAD on a weekly basis, we can't 
call this a bearish divergence because we're not sure that the market is done going up yet, right? Um, you know, now if we were, if we had a pivot up here and we started to sell off and, and, and RSI started to roll over, then that would be absolutely considered a, uh, you know, a bearish divergence for sure. Um, in, but just because you have a bearish divergence doesn't mean that the market needs to reverse trend. Um, it, it's just a warning that we are changing trend. So we can go from an up market to perhaps a sideways market, um, you know, something like that. Um, and then these divergences, you know, they have different impacts. You know, I would argue, I could argue that we had a little mini uh, bearish divergence right here. You see that on the on the highs earlier this year, and that caused the correction. So in this case, that we're still making higher highs, um, you know, we don't know that this is a pivot point just yet. Um, so when we do have a pivot point and then we start to fail, that's when it could be a, uh, a, a, a divergence. And remember, in some cases, in a lot of, in, I don't know, some cases, in strong markets, you'll get the bearish divergences and then they'll work their way up through time. You know, we saw that in the S&P 500 uh, earlier in the year. I, think, I believe we saw it last year as well. Um, in fact, we can push it up. We have the technology. Let's see. We can look at the S&P 500. And here you get some bearish divergences, right? Um, up here, and they created a problem, you know, and everything is within context. Sure, we had corrections, um, but in, in, in the whole structure of things, it really wasn't that big of a deal. Um, here, we have a much bigger bearish divergence, as you can see, key pivot points. You had the highs up here, right, where you had highs in, in, in momentum, and then you had a correction, and then a rally to new highs, another pivot high, and momentum was nowhere near here. So you had a very, very bad bearish divergence. So when do you know? Once these former highs from July get broken to the downside, now we know we have a pivot high. That's confirmation that we're breaking down. And that's how I, that's how I look at it. Excellent. That and I point these out in all of our packages, guys. I point these out, uh, you know, if, they're, if I'm warning up a potential one or, if, you know, if we break this level, it confirms a bearish divergence. So. I try to be as detailed as possible uh, in all of our reports. Thanks, JC. Uh, John is looking at the offer, at the, at the two packages here at vip.marketify.com slash jc hyphen parents. It's going to be up on your screen just here shortly. And John is asking, could you briefly go over what's included um, that, that comes in every day versus every week versus every month? Sure. Um, so all of these packages, uh, whether it's the Dow 30 package or the global markets package or averages and interest rates, sectors, we have five different packages. You're receiving uh, a report once a week, um, you know, with a quick summary of, you know, what are some of the things that maybe stand out in this particular week or some of the things that maybe hit our target that we have been talking about over the last couple of weeks or maybe we're hoping for something to happen and it did and we're getting that confirmation. It would work that. And we're but we, we, every single package comes on multiple time frames. So you're going to get the, the weekly charts for a more structural perspective, and then you're going to get the daily charts uh, for a more tactical outlook. And, and, and I think that's very, very important to understand where we are structurally and then use that information to either get in, in, a, in a mean reversion sort of trade or if there's a lack of trend, for example, in a flat 200 week or flat 200 day, perhaps we just want to stay away from it or understanding where the trend is. So the gold package, you're going to get... 90 plus charts uh, on all the global markets you're going to get all the Latin American ETFs that we discussed you know Brazil Chile Peru Mexico uh, on multiple time frames you're going to get everything in Europe Germany France Italy Spain all of these and these are US exchange traded funds that trade here so EWP for example is Spain uh, ILF for example is Latin America uh, DXJ for example is uh, Japan so you're going to get everything out in Asia Asia Pacific Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, again, over 90 charts. And in addition, you're going to get for free uh, the U.S. averages and interest rates. So, again, on multiple time frames, Dow, S&P, uh, uh, um, Russell 2000, mid caps, micro caps, um, you're going to get all of those um, on a weekly basis. And then, again, obviously, you have access to me as well, as we discussed before. And then the platinum package, which I think is the best deal we have on the table right now, you're going to get all those global, all those global markets, um, the 90 plus charts that we just mentioned, with access to me. But you're also going to get the S and P sector. So this is like, you know, ETF bonanza right here. You're getting everything around the world and everything domestic as well. 
and the S&P sectors and subsectors, you're getting over 60 charts. You're not just getting the 10 major sectors, which are financials, energy, utilities, staples, discretionary, etc. You're also getting the subsectors. So in addition to XLF, which is financials, you'll get broker dealers, IAI, and you'll also get um, regional banks, KRE. So in, 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 in you'll, get, you'll get the basic materials, XLB, but then you also get the metals and mining, XME. You'll also get the uh, gold miners, GDX. So you're getting not just the major sectors, but you're getting the subsectors as well, which I think really, really adds a lot of value, especially looking at them together. Uh, energy is a great example of that. You know, um, we were looking at energy, uh, a failed breakout in energy, right? And then if, uh, on a weekly time frame on XLE, and then if you looked at what was happening uh, over the last couple of months in XOP, which are the uh, exploration names, um, they were putting in a head and shoulders pattern, and tactically we were shorting that very aggressively, um, and also OIH, which is the oil services, looking terrible. So understanding how bad energy is from a structural perspective really helped us break it down tactically into some of the subsectors. So I think that's actually, um, now that I think about it, a great example as to uh, why we look at the sectors and subsectors, number one, and why we look at it in a multiple time frame. So I urge you guys to take advantage of that one. Platinum package, nine ninety nine a year. The offer ends tomorrow. Um, I think that's the best package we have on the table for sure. Yeah, and at that discount, JC, it's such a generous offer too. Uh, to, to get that level of insight on a daily basis, and everyone here has seen a, sort of a preview of the insight that that people will be receiving on, on the daily and weekly basis in this webinar that you just presented. Those kinds of insights that you're sharing with us now are just a preview of the, the kinds of content that everyone's going to get in their inbox on a, on a regular basis for a full year with that platinum package. I see um, people are buying that. I'm, I'm getting emails, people actually buying that particular package as we speak. Um, so it seems to, be, uh, seems to be the popular one, as it should be. That's my favorite one. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I mean, we do want to have a special welcome for everybody who is uh, who is currently signing up for that package. So thank you. And again, that's available at vip.marketfy.com slash jc hyphen parrots. Now, the next question comes from Mark. Mark wrote, thanks, JC. Great presentation. Do you see a bearish divergence on the DJU XLU charts you showed earlier? The DJU XLU charts. Um... Um, so here's the, the Dow Jones Utility Index, and you know, again, getting back to what we were talking about before, we don't know that this is a pivot high in price. In fact, we made all-time highs today. So we, we, we can't just assume that the, today's high was the high. In fact, I would argue otherwise. I, I think we'd probably go higher. But yeah, let's just say that we do break down. Um, and we start getting back below the the highs from 2007, 2008, and that is indeed a pivot high. And let's just say today's high is the high. None of us have any way of knowing. But let's just say today's high is the all-time high, and we start getting crushed from here for whatever reason. Um, then, yes, it would absolutely be a bearish divergence, and we start breaking down below the 07 highs. Um, you know, that's really the confirmation of the bearish divergence. I would say sitting where we are today, that's probably the, um, the lower probability outcome. Um, XLU looks exactly the same, if I'm not mistaken. There it is. Looks exactly the same. Um, you know, actually, in the, in the XLU, we're not even above the, the, the 07 highs just yet. Um, so I could see potentially this being some sort of resistance. We've been acknowledging this throughout 2014 already in a very healthy way. Um, so notice how in the pivot high that we had earlier in the year, we did have a bearish divergence. You see that? And we've been working it off through time. That's a very, very healthy consolidation. Very, very healthy. Because remember, markets can correct either through price or through time. And this is correcting and acknowledging that former uh, overhead supply through time. Um, it doesn't get healthier than that. Awesome, JC. We've got a, a couple people asking if you could clarify your view on the relationship between uh, the dollar and different currencies with gold and precious metals. Sure, that's a great, uh, that's actually a fantastic question. So, and, and this I think goes down to really understanding what your time frame is. You know, are you a short-term trader? Are you more, uh, you know, are you looking bigger picture? You know, who are you as an investor and what are your goals? I think it's very important to, to define that. So let's just, let's just a little bit of history here. Um, you know, 
in May, uh, you know, we we disliked precious metals for a while, um, and the fact that gold was doing very well, um, uh, the dollar we expected to do very well, we shouldn't be surprised that um, the the gold has sold off during that same time frame. Now, one of the reasons that over the last month I've expected some sort of bounce in the metals, which we're actually getting. I mean, it's not a great bounce, but we're getting some acknowledgement of that support. Um, I figured we'd do that because, number one, you have extreme bullish sentiment in um, in the dollar. As we run into this downtrend line from 2005 that we approached very, very quickly, um, but gold was getting down to that support, which was our initial target um, when, we, when we started to hate gold again, um, and we got down to those levels. So it made sense for us to acknowledge the support in metals. Um, silver actually hit, it's not detailed here, uh, silver uh, hit actually a, a nice Fibonacci um, extension here from the most recent correction. So silver actually said a bounce was coming too, even though the bounce of silver is terrible. Um, I would say that the fact that in this particular bounce, this little mini bounce that we expected, the fact that gold is outperforming silver, um, I think agrees with the overall bearish structural picture. Because if there was real risk appetite for precious metals, you would expect silver to be outperforming gold. But the exact opposite is happening. And in this little mini bounce, gold is the one that's outperforming silver. So that is even more reason for me to think that this break of key support uh, and new lows in silver is definitely coming soon. In fact, look for silver to make new lows as a, as a heads up that gold's about to break the support. I think that's the way I would look at it. In terms of the dollar index itself, um, you know, as much as I think that we can correct here, um, the fact that we're, it's holding up this long up here, I would argue, is definitely a, 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 a bullish development over the last several weeks um, instead of just completely crashing. Um, so if, you know, short term, I just don't like the dollar. Um, and short term, I can see a little bit more strength in precious metals. But bigger picture, um, you know, I would say that you want to trade each one on its own. Um, don't overthink it. As much intermarket work that we do and that I do, and as much intermarket information that I'm always preaching and everything like that, at the end of the day, sure, using other markets for information is great, and I highly advise it, but make sure that you're analyzing what you're trading. Don't do one thing strictly because of something else, right? So in this case, yeah, it's make, the intermarket relationships are making sense over the last few weeks as dollars have stalled and, and metals have rallied a little bit, a bigger picture, we only want to be short gold below uh, that 1180 level um, that's been supported over the last year and a half, regardless of what the dollar's doing. So, you know, sure, we have our theories of gold and we have our theories of the dollar and silver, and we, we have a kind of a game plan for each one. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we're going to short gold because gold is breaking down. You know, we shorted silver um, because silver broke, you know, silver broke down. We expected it to break down. We think silver heads lower, regardless of what we think is going to happen in the dollar or Europe or Malaysia or Canada. You know, we're, we're trading silver because we think it goes lower. We're, we're showing gold on the break because we think it goes lower, and it has nothing to do with currencies. That's just really additional information um, that we'll, we'll use to come up with our overall conclusion. But price pays, guys. That's the only thing that matters It's price. So that's the most important thing. I hope that answers your question. I wish I had a better answer. Thanks, JC. And I know that we are a little bit over time, but we have so many great questions. Do you have some extra time for us to uh, to answer a few more? Yep, I got. I have a couple minutes. All right. So th this one's coming in from FT. FT wants to know, JC, have you looked at the Argentina graph? If so, what do you think? Yeah, That's I mean, Argentina. no, it's it's yeah, it's not a market that I look at. Um, you know, there's not really a lot of liquid ways for for myself and for our members to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we have certain restrictions in terms of, um, you know, not anything that I want to get into uh, for this particular purpose, but we'll just leave it at, um, you know, we have certain restrictions on what we can buy and sell in terms of the liquidity uh, aspects of it, and that's just not something that we can really participate in uh, for whatever the reason. So it's just not a market that I worry about, right? So, um, no, I don't. I don't look at it. Sorry. All right, Elizabeth is asking, how are, how are the newsletters delivered? And I, I can answer that one for you, Elizabeth. They are delivered instantly via email. They'll arrive in your email inbox. And there's also there's a homepage that you can visit to, uh, to revisit those newsletters whenever you are. Um, but 
instantly, the moment that the newsletter is published, the moment that those charts are published and the, the analysis is published, it will be delivered directly to you. Next one comes in from uh, JS. JS wants to know, can you speak to the recent false breakdown in the IWM or the SPY and why you might not be as bullish as other false breakdowns? It's a great question. In fact, I was actually having this argument with a good friend of mine um, today, in fact, and a very, very smart friend of mine um, that I, I respect his opinion greatly. Um, and, you know, he, he thinks that it is one. Um, I would argue that it is not um, for a lot of reasons. Number one, um, we're, we're now in a bearish range um, in, in relative strength index. I'm sure we had a little mini bullish divergence here, but not anything where we had uh, two consecutive pivot points where I would say, um, you know, this is a, a beautiful failed uh, breakdown and we're heading a lot higher. You know, I, I just don't see it that way um, in, in terms of uh, the momentum itself. Um, I'll show you guys another one where you can see why it is so good. Um, you know, another one that I did like very much, number one. Number two, um, remember the market isn't always clean. So in this case, all of these former support levels, you know, you could draw support here. You can argue that this was the support and that's your failed breakdown, which is probably what you're looking at. But we also have that former support as well, right? So it's not always that clean, right? It's not always that clean. Um, and in this case, it's messy. I don't like messy charts. I would never buy this for a failed break, uh, failed breakdown. In fact, with a 200-day 200, uh, 200 uh, moving average rolling over, um, I would say that a, a rollover here is coming again, and we're probably seeing lower lows very quickly. But I would say the reasons, too much overhead supply um, for multiple reasons, not just that we have this former support, but now we have this former support as well, turning into resistance you can see today perfectly. Look at that candle today, beautiful outside day. Uh, after yesterday. Um, so I would say that no, this is not a, a failed breakdown. Um, you know, I think maybe temporarily it, it may have been, sure. Um, but I think we're rolling over pretty hard here. I would be selling any and all strength in the Russell 2000. This is one of the worst places to be in the United States of America. Um, you know, the small caps have been underperforming all year. It's, this one is just not for me. Um, you know, it, it, as long as we're above these previous lows, from over here, from late last year and a couple of the support levels this year. I would say we're probably in no man's land right here. Um, in a more neutral stance, it's probably appropriate. If we look at the actual RUT, I believe it was the 1100 level uh, where I'm neutral, um, um, you know, 1080 to 1100. Sure we are here, we are exactly between 1080 and 1100 where we are uh, more neutral. But here we're seeing the exact same thing in the index itself rather than the ETF, you know, former support turning into resistance. This is just pretty messy. I think we're heading a lot lower. Um, so that's that, that's why I'm saying it's not the cleanest. Let's see. I have a good one here. Um, we'll go back and look at silver in the summer you know, of 2012. Believe it or not, I have been a silver bull in the past, contrary to popular belief. Um, 2012. Let's see, I remember like it was yesterday. Here it is. Um, myself and a good friend of mine who you all know, I won't mention by name, we were on Bloomberg Radio um, at the time, and uh, I was very, uh, very bullish about the silver here. You have a bullish divergence right there. Look how nice that bullish divergence is. See how different this looks than what we just got in the Russell 2000? You have pivots. You have a pivot here and then another pivot there, and you, you, we didn't even get into oversold conditions on the RSI. You see that? And then sure enough, after a little time, we got the major move, right? So that is a, a bullish divergence that I absolutely love. In fact, if you look at the euro at the exact same time, I've been a euro bull in the past also, contrary to popular belief. See this? Here's another. This is simultaneously. See that? A pivot low, a rally, another pivot low, and the bullish divergence. As soon as we got back above this level here, that was your signal. We only wanted to be long above that level. So a pivot low and a pivot low. So those are two that I really, really liked a lot. Um, Let's look at the U.S. dollar index back in 2009. It was a great bearish divergence. Here we go. Look how nice this is. So here's your failed breakout, right? A pivot, a pivot high in the fall. Another pivot high in March. There was a huge negative correlation between this and the uh, S&P 500, actually, by the way. Um, so from an intermarket perspective, this gave us a lot of information telling us that the U.S. stock market had already bottomed. Um, on top of a lot of other things as well. 
Um, I should probably do a webinar talking about all the signals that we got uh, for a bottom in 2009. Note to self. But here we are. So you got a pivot low, a pivot high, excuse me, and then another pivot high. And look at momentum diverging the entire time. So you had three bearish divergences. You had one here, pivot high, correction, rally, another lower high in momentum, correction, another rally. We briefly exceeded that. So now we had a failed breakdown also, another bearish momentum divergence. Um, and then uh, obviously we know that we crashed as the U.S. stock market rallied higher. So getting back to what we're seeing in the Russell 2000, we're not seeing any of that. We have these, we, we just have this little mini, little, little, little mini higher low that caused this kind of, uh, uh, you know, quick, brief little rally over the last week, but we don't have those consecutive pivot lows uh, that we had in some of the other ones that I just pointed out. So that would be uh, one of the reasons that I would say this is not failed breakdown. This is not a bullish divergence in momentum either, and those other ones were. So I hope, uh, I hope that clarifies that a little bit. Thanks, JC. And we have Dale asking about the 30-day money-back guarantee. And yes, Dale, on both of those packages, there is a 30-day money-back guarantee. Um, the reason that we offer that is because we are so confident that you will be satisfied. We've seen so many, um, so many subscribers who just love the newsletters and who just can't get enough of it. But we do understand that um, to give you a little bit more comfort in signing up, we do offer that 30-day money-back guarantee. So it really is a no-risk subscription. Um, and we are running a little bit over time, JC, so thank you for sticking with us. We will close with this last question, which I love. It's from Neil. Neil is asking, I'm thinking of taking the plunge and becoming a full-time trader. I'm just getting started with trading. What's your advice to me? How did you get started? You know, that's uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I love the fact that we're ending on, on this particular note. Can you, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Um, yeah, so I, I like the fact that we're ending on this particular note. Um, you know, so the, the way that, the, the one thing, and I get asked this question a lot, you know, what is one, um, you know, what is one piece of advice you would offer new traders, you know, new guys uh, or gals coming into the business? Um, you know, I would, I would really say that it, it comes down to risk management. And these are lessons that I learned the hard way myself. These are, you know, some might call it a tuition. These are lessons that I learned the easy way watching other people lose money, um, you know, saying, you know, thinking that they're smarter than the market. Remember, the market is smarter than all of us, number one. Number two, we don't know where any, you know, we don't know where the market is going tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen next. Nobody does. Um, if they do, they're lying to you. We, none of us have any idea. We can do all the intermarket market work that we want and, you know, all the trend lines and Fibonacci and momentum, and we can go back and forth about this all day. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is risk management because if nobody knows where the market is going and what's going to happen next, then the, the, only, the, the ones that win are the ones that manage risk the best. That's what separates the winners from the losers. So the old saying, I believe it was the great Paul Tudor Jones, pretty sure it was him, he said, losers average down losers. You, know, you don't want to put good money after bad. And before you enter any trade, and this is something that we focus on extensively, obnoxiously so, um, in our weekly reports and, you know, anytime I talk to new investors, before we enter any position, that risk needs to be defined. At what point are we wrong? And by the way, you know, we look at some of these trades that, you know, I've made over the years. And I'll just point out a couple. I don't know what I just did with the chart. Um, actually, we'll just stick with this one, keep it simple. Um, it's really defining the trade. So let's talk about just maybe some of my best trades over the years, and I'll explain to you why. It's not because they worked, and I'll, I'll show you something that didn't work, in fact. It's not because they worked. It's because the risk was very well defined. Here we are in the summer of 2011, okay? Come on. I don't know why this isn't working. So this is summer of 2011. Here we go. The S&P 500 broke to new lows here, right? Broke to new lows and got quickly back above. So getting long the S&P 500, the stop loss is right there. We break down below the previous lows, all bets are off. So the risk is very well defined. So it's not that it works so well, it's that if, we, if it hadn't worked, the risk would have been nothing. So it's all about defining your risk. And this is the Russell 2000, but the S&P did the same thing actually during that time frame. See, there it is. Actually, it was even cleaner there. So that was a beautiful, beautiful trade. So coming into the year, I get a lot of credit because I was one of the few bond bulls coming into the year. Forget the fact that I was right. The risk was so well defined coming into the year. 
those lows get taken out or we break back below the lows in August, all bets are off. So look how little the risk is compared to the reward. So the fact that this worked, great, people give me credit, I'm happy about it, terrific. That's not the best part about this trade. The best part about this trade is that the risk would have been absolutely nothing. Let's look at the dollar index as a great example um, that we talked about how in May I was bullish because of all the bearish extremes and the failed breakdown. The fact that, the, that we did get the epic squeeze that I had hoped for isn't the point. The point is, is that the risk was so well defined. If we break down below those lows, all bets are off. All bets are off, guys. So it's not that we were right. It's that if we were wrong, it wouldn't have done anything. In fact, let me show you guys the chart real time. Let's see, this is a great chart. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we're doing this. Uh, US dollar, epic, uh, here we are. So here, we're looking at that chart real time. You can see the epic squeeze that we're talking about. You see that? You had the breakdown, right? This is what it, the US dollar looked like at the time. That's why everyone was bearish, because it looks like a topping pattern, and we got a failed breakdown. So that's the entry right there. We roll over, all bets are off. See? And here's a candlestick chart showing the exact same thing, right? What did I say? The epic squeeze higher in US dollars just began. That's pretty funny. Um, so look at that. We got a brief breakdown, and this is in what, this is what day? This is May 12th. So May 12th, this was right here. Yep, yeah, it was right here. So yeah, the epic squeeze in the US dollars had just begun. And here's the failed breakdown. And then here's what's happening in the euro simultaneously. So if you look at the sentiment for the euro at the time, everybody loved the euro at the exact wrong time. Failed breakout above the downtrend line. In fact, this is actually what the US dollar looks like right now. So it's actually pretty scary. Um, so I loved it. And then here was the sentiment in the dollar at the time. Everybody hated the dollar. So that's the reason that I thought that that was a no-brainer trade. And again, getting back to the reason you guys asked me this question, you know, what's the one piece of advice? Is manage risk. If you if if you can't tell me or yourself for that matter where you're wrong on a particular trade, and you can't define the risk, how can you calculate what the risk versus reward is? And if you can't calculate what the risk versus reward is, how can you possibly uh, know if that risk reward meets your time horizon meets your risk parameters all of these very important questions that need to be answered before entering a position cannot be answered unless you can define the risk and then with that being said when you're actually executing and you are wrong get out <laughs> you know you have to be disciplined as well it's not just defining your risk but it's actually doing it right and here's one that I got wrong um, here's what I got right um, in corn earlier in the year but here's what I got wrong I got very bullish corn right here Right there, I got very bullish corn on this quick reversal. The USDA came out with a report on this day. It was August the 12th. Very, very excited about corn. Um, you, you can't see momentum here, but we were putting in a bullish momentum divergence as well. As soon as we broke down right here, that's it. All bets are off. We were wrong. And sure enough, we got clobbered after that. So if you're not disciplined, you're going to get you're gonna get crushed. So as bullish as I was right here, I was wrong. Guys, there's no egos. We're not economists. We're not analysts. We're not journalists. We don't have to be right. We just have to make money. Um, and looking for those risk-reward opportunities is really the only thing that we care about and what we focus on in our reports. I'm never going to talk about earnings or um, you know what some economist said or something like that. We're focused on price, sentiment, momentum, you know, uh, trend recognition, pattern recognition, but most importantly, risk management. That's all that matters, guys. So that's my one piece of advice. I hope that uh, I hope that answer uh, is sufficient. Man, JC, thank you so much. The accolades are coming in. I've been looking at thank yous and thanks, JCs, and so, so many of those are coming in through the chat. This has been a phenomenal presentation. I've learned so much. I know everyone in the audience has learned so much. I'm seeing awesome job. Um, I want to thank everyone for for coming and, and sticking with us. I'm sure you got a lot out of this. I know I did. Um, I'm going to leave the webinar room open for just uh, another few seconds once uh, once we close the presentation, just so you, everybody has a chance to click on that link. One last time, look at the offer right in front of you. You can either get the, the month of global markets and the full year of U.S. averages and interest rates for $129. That's 37% off. Or the platinum package, which is a year of global markets, a year of S&P sectors. That's 36% off, only $999. 
an incredibly affordable price for what you're getting, the amount of value that you're getting, and the, the kind of uh, the kind of advantage that you'll have as a subscriber to that. So do take advantage at vip.marketify.com slash jc parrot and you'll also see that link right there in your go to webinar chat box. Thank you, JC. Thank you everyone for coming out. And we'll leave the room open for just a little bit longer, but this ends the presentation. Thanks everyone.